Well, there won't be any clinking of glasses this autonomous lounge because Amaryllis Tiger has decided to put me on wine for the next three weeks. Did you know that dark wines are good as a fat burner? Oh, yeah. Actually, I don't even know if that's fucking true, but I've just been in the mood for wine. I like the Shiraz Grenache. Those are some good ones. All right, so let's get on with the lounge. You know, I was listening to the Lumpen Proletariat episode right before I uploaded it last Saturday, and it was too late to do anything about it. I realized that I still felt that at the end of the episode, I left the conclusion that the Lumpen Proletariat was a foe. And the Lumpen Proletariat doesn't have to be a foe. That's not what I really meant. I hope that no one no one felt that way. I felt like at the end I still left it at that. They were a foe. But no, that's not what I was trying to say. Also, in, in, in some cases, you know, the Lumpen Proletariat has been used and exploited themselves in a reverse dynamic where the activist community has exploited them. That's it's very rare when that happens, but the going the running theory from people that you would consider or called that are called the ultra left is that they actually would use or see the lumpen proletariat as shock troops for a radical or revolutionary cause that they would be the ones to start shit if if things begin to pop off. Now, that's a messed up viewpoint, in my opinion, because it kind of puts them in the, the lumpen proletariat in this viewpoint that they're expendable. And I don't agree with that at all. And I think that it's a very exploitative viewpoint as the ruling class would use the lumpen proletariat for their ends. So, no. Um, perfect example, just a quick story. There was an organization called the Revolutionary Communist Party. Uh, this was a Marxist-Leninist outfit that, I mean, sorry, Maoist outfit, really, that used to do weird shit. I mean, they just needed to prove all the time that the state will come down on you no matter how moderate or how modest your attempts at some form of demonstration or protest would be. They wanted to show that the state was ready to come down hard on the people. So they would always make, they were going through this trend where they needed to constantly make freedom of speech the issue, no matter what you were having a demo or a protest about. You could be, you could be having a protest trying to get a Puerto Rican liberation front off of death row who had been on death row for 30 years. And these assholes would show up and say, let's burn a flag to prove that you know, we're living, we're not living in a democracy in, in a land that respects freedom of speech. And you're like, go away. Just shut the fuck up and go away. And what these dudes would do every now and then would be like, you know, they'd see a homeless person just laid out, passed out someplace. And they'd go, hey, brother, do you know that the reason why you're in this situation is because of capitalism? Yeah, man, those bastards up there got you down and got you on this park bench. Lay it down in a pool of your own vomit. Come and join us, brother. Uh, we'll give you $40 and another pint of, what's he drinking? Strawberry Kiwi 2020. Strawberry Kiwi 2020 if you come with us. And, you know, the homeless dude would be like, what? More alcohol? Wait, a white girl. I'm coming with you. So then, you know, next thing you know, this dude would show up at the demos and suddenly we're to believe that he was a member of the RCP all this time. And then he busts out with the flag and then they burn the flag. And next thing you know, your demonstration about getting someone who was a member of the Puerto Rican Liberation Front been on death row for 30 years is now a fucking police riot. So that's the way the lumpen proletariat is exploited. Now we're going to go on to the main event. And of course, parenting while being radical or radical while parenting yeah that's it this is like the fourth title change of this mini series radical while parenting part two parenting while being radical part two discipline 
We've had people actually express surprise when they've seen Miss Autonomous and I say no to our kids. Or we can't stories where we put them on punishment or talked about chores. Their expressions of surprise have actually surprised us. What, you thought we were letting our kids running around unbathed and telling us to fuck off when we ask about their homework? No. Miss Autonomous, the non-feminist feminist, takes on the homework, the educational and worldly experience part of our children's lives. The bigger picture stuff, so that our two girls would grow up to be women who aren't hair twirlers or basic brood mares to be. While I deal with the daily routine and discipline, like cleaning rooms, chores, and making sure they know how to take care of themselves. It's not a good look to be 21 years old and not know how to do laundry or cook or shop for food. Also, they picked up house improvement skills from me, and I bought both of them ratchet screwdrivers and those folding multi-tool suspension pliers. Again, this is a no hair twirlers zone. The surprise coming from new friends and strangers alike, if they know Miss Autonomous and I's politics, they seem to think that we have some sort of free-for-all household. And wouldn't the way we raise our kids contradict that? But the answer is no. The idea of cleanliness and keeping shit in order is, ba- is pretty basic. It's about keeping your life and environment around you in order. Organization is key to anything you want to do, even if you might not be good at it. You should always strive for it. Miss Autonomous is on the academic, not that I'm not, front because she wants them to understand that the world will always be looking to not take them seriously as women and women of color. And they need to be competitive and not afraid to work for what they want. They are both going to grow up to be women of color in a world that will have their perceptions of them off the bat as either no threat at all or not competitive enough. We know that as adults, we are here to protect them and watch out for their well-being because they are young. As less experienced people, they will most likely make decisions that are not good and that would work against their own welfare. So we understand as parents, we should be guiding them and developing them towards adulthood. And hopefully they will take on the values we instill in them, like doing the work that will build a better society for all. But what we don't want to do is foster a culture of conformity without question. It was something that even I had to unlearn raising our children as I come from a background where you were told to do something and you didn't question it. Miss Autonomous would go through an explanation of what the kids were told to do so they'd understand why. Or she'd simply answer their question as to why. I used to say what I was raised to say, which was, because I told you to, but in the end I realized that I do not want robots. We both don't want robots. I do not want my children to grow up to be hamburger helpers that will look to bosses, cops, and people who are perceived as rich and powerful to be the authority that cannot be questioned and, more importantly, cannot be resisted. And so, we raise them to question authority and authoritarianism, and at the same time, respect us as their parents and guardians and their living space and surroundings. Well, that's all I have to say about our part of discipline as radical parents.